Good evening, and welcome to another presentation on the Minor Prophets. Tonight we are going to do, uh, we, we are continuing with Micah. Uh, we are going to really uh, r visit and study chapters 3 to 5 of Micah. And today's lesson is entitled, Judgment Now, Blessings Later. I really hope that you will enjoy this lesson. We will be touching on some incredible stuff. Uh, we will be seeing uh, God's condemnation of Israel's leaders. We will see indictment of Israel's religious leaders. We will be looking at uh, the future exaltation of Zion and a messianic hope. Um, and, uh, and of course, we will be, this messianic hope looks at not only uh, what Jesus did when he came to earth, but what Jesus will be doing when he comes a second time. And, uh, and um, we, we will then see the, we'll be talking about the coming Messiah. And then a feather judgment on Israel and her enemies. Um, and that's an interesting uh, situation. So, I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to ask the Lord to bless us tonight. Um, and I really hope uh, that uh, those of you here in this class, that you have your uh, document. Those at home, please accompany um, the screen as you uh, attend to the meeting at home. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, you're an incredible God. As we study Scripture and the Word, we see your amazing love. You see a grace that is incomprehensible. We see a God that loves us with such an incredible love that it is almost impossible to capture it and to understand it. And we see a God that has done everything throughout the years here on earth, the thousands of years here on earth, to get us back home to live with you eternally. Micah as a prophet was sent to Judah and Israel to really tell the people that they needed to turn back to you, to trust you, and to be yours. And Father, as we go through those chapters, three to five, and we open it, I want to ask, O oh Lord, that the Holy Spirit be present, that you take our words and you transform them into your words to each hearer. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so a little introduction to, um, to, to last week's uh, meeting. Uh, if you remember, Elisa taught uh, chapters 1 and 2. So let's do a little introduction and, um, and uh, just um, a quick intro to this week's lesson. <clears throat> In our previous lesson on the book of Micah, chapters 1 and 2, we looked at some, uh, at some background material concerning Micah. Concerning Micah the prophet and the book of Micah. And we discussed the first of three messages written in the book. Concerning Micah the prophet, we learned that his name means who is like Jehovah or uh, Jehovah. That he was from Marasheth Gath, which is a town 20 to 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. That he was a contemporary prophet of Isaiah. And that he became a prophet of the poor and the downtrodden. Concerning Micah the book, we learned that the prophecies written by Micah occurred around 735 to 700 B.C., before Christ. And they were directed toward both Israel and Judah. 
and that the, the general theme appears to be present judgment followed by future blessings. We saw that last week. We're going to see that today, and we'll see that next Friday. We briefly considered the first of three messages in the book. It is worthy to note that each message begins with here. So last week on Micah chapter 1 verses 2, the message began with, Ear you my people, all you people. Today as we're going to study, the Micah 3 1 begins with, Ear now, O ads of Jacob and you rulers of the house of Israel. We're going to concentrate on the, weak, the, 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 the problems that the leaders of Israel were bringing into Israel. And then Mike's, uh, Micah 6 next week will begin with, Hear now what the Lord says. The first message proclaimed the coming judgment and promised restoration as it described the judgment pronounced upon Israel and Judah, the reasons for the coming judgment, and the promise of the restoration of a remnant. In our lesson today, we will consider and discuss Micah's second message as presented in Micah chapter 3, verses 1, to, to, to chapter 5, verses 15. You will notice that this second message also follows a similar theme as the previous message. First, God's condemnation of Israel and then a glimpse of the future hope. Please note that this second message has much more to say about the future hope, especially regarding the Messiah. However, it begins with God's condemnation of Israel's leaders. So then let's go into viewing, studying, researching, and discussing God's condemnation of Israel leaders. There is an indictment on the first four verses of chapter 3. Indictment of Israel's civil leaders. So let's read that. In Micah chapter 3 verses 1 to 4, Scripture says, And I said, Ye are now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? What a question from the prophet. Verse 2, You who ate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. Oh, we are going to discuss all that. Verse 4. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face. God hides his face from then at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. What an introduction to the study of chapter 3. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, Micah describes the outrageous conduct of the rulers. He denounces the injustice and oppression of the rulers and false prophets. Notice in verse 1 how the prophet asks them, Is it not for you to know justice? These leaders in Israel should have known what is just and right and should have practiced it. However, as it's so, oft, uh, so often the case, the possessors of power abuse their authority. This is unfortunate. The more prominent the person is among the people and the more important is his or her work, the wider is the range of their influence. It happens in every country. In every country. And the more important is his or her work, the wider is the range of their influence. And so these leaders may use this influence for good, or they may use their uh, prominence or authority to encourage evil, as is the case here. In verse 2, the prophet tells the civil leaders in Israel that they hate good and love evil. This was not uncommon for Israel and Judah. We see this in Amos, 
chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Let's read that. Where the, pro where, where the prophet asks Israel to seek good and not evil, that you may leave, so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Verse 14, eight, as you have spoken, eight evil, love good. Then he goes on to say, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. In John chapter 3, verses 20, we read, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Instead of being the shepherds of the flock to guide and protect the sheep, these leaders were butchers of the flock, leaving on them. Here's what Ezekiel says in chapter 34, verses 2 to 6. Uh, could somebody read that for me? Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, not have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor broke back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Thanks so much, Danielle. In verse 3, Micah tells the civil leaders in Judah that they are oppressed of the people. He tells them that they are eating the flesh of my people, flaying their skin, breaking their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot. In this striking metaphoric fiction, the prophet emphasizes the utter selfish greed of the nation's rulers in their dealings with the common people. Elsewhere in Scripture, we read Psalm 14:4. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call on the Lord. Amos chapter 8, verses 4. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. Ellen G. White in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, pages 261, says that. If the truth has not sanctified, made pure and clean, the hands and arts of him who minister in holy things, then he is liable to speak according to his own imperfect experience. And when he speaks of himself according to the decisions of his own unsanctified judgment, his counsel is not of God, but of himself. As he that is called of God is called to be holy, so he that is approved and set apart of man must be, give evidence of his holy calling and show forth in his heavenly conversation and conduct that he is faithful to God who has called him. Let's go on, verse 4. So in verse 4, Micah tells the civil leaders in Israel that a judgment is coming upon them because of their oppression and injustice. The prophet tells them that they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. And that God will hide his face from them. You see, when divine mercy is persistently rejected, and the account is finally closed, it will be useless for human beings to plead for the removal of the judgment. People have had a day of opportunity, and even if they are given another chance, they would most likely continue their will, willful course. By the way, that will happen when probation closes. Further discussion and explanation. Let's uh, unpack this a little more. When Prophet Micah entered the capital city of Jerusalem to bring the word of God to the leaders of Judah, this, he was sent by God. 
He understood that there was sin in the outlying areas of the country and among the common people in Jerusalem. But this was nothing compared to the evil among the ruling class. I want you to pay attention to that. Our presentation tonight is going to concentrate on the ruling class. So who are the ruling class? The priests, the temple leaders, the temple leaders and the leaders, Kings. the king and his man. Okay. What troubled God and Micah the most was the sin in the courts, the places and the temple, or the palaces and the temple. Courts, palaces, and temple. Priests, prophets, and rulers. That's really what it says. All three branches of government were corrupt. Worse yet, they worked end in end. Hmm. Not very different from some of the governances we see. Note that chapter 3 contains three sections. Section 1, verses 1 to 4, concerns judges and the corruption of their courts. Section 2, verses 5 to 8, concerns prophets who speak well for those who pay them to speak well. Section 3, verses 9 to 12, Concerns politicians and government leaders who gain support from the others for money. Let's go into indictment of Israel's religious leaders. We are going to look at verses 5 to 8 in Micah 3. Let's read it. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who made my people stray. Ooh, strong stuff who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but to prepare war against him who put nothing in their mouths. Therefore you shall have night without vision, and you shall have darkness without divination. So when we look at verses 5 to 8, who, you, who are we talking about? The prophets. Okay. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. By the way, that last statement, that is Micah saying, I am full of the power of the Spirit. Oh, this is beautiful. If, if you think that I love Scripture and the Bible, I really do, because one learns so much when one studies. All right. So let's, let's look at the note. In verses 5 to 8, Micah denounces the sins of the false prophets he deceived, uh, the, who deceived the people and pronounces God's judgment upon them. He shows that they thought only of themselves and of their living. In siding with the rich, they closed their eyes to the social conditions of the people, and they failed to attract the sins, or to attack the sins of the time. Now let's look at the verses 5, five to 7. In verses 5 to 7, Prof, Prophet Micah describes the judgment to come upon the, the false prophets. In verse 5, he says that this judgment will come because the false prophets lead God's people astray. Micah says they chew or bite with their teeth. This could suggest that the false prophets may here be referring to eating. If this is correct, this expression would signify that the prophets, when bribed with food, would always foretell the well-being of people bribe. There would never be anything wrong with those people. On the other hand, some scholars think that this reference suggests venom ejected by the false prophets when they pronounce peace, be at peace. They really don't mean that. While intending to inject into the deceived soul the poison of 
disaster and death. So I can tell to somebody, I'm going to bless you. You will have peace. And in my mind, I'm saying, I just hope that this person will be dead tomorrow. God tells us in Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, My hand will be against the prophets who envision futility and do who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God, because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace, and when builds a wall, and they plaster it with untempered mortar. Prophet Micah goes on to say, And they put nothing into their mouths. This tells us that false prophets become hostile to those who did not bribe them. There was not food given to the prophet before he prophesied. G. Campbell Morgan in Living Messages of the Book of the Bible, Micah, page 246, has the following to say. Micah recognizes the place of delegated authority in the economy of God, and he spoke to princes, priests, and prophets as to the representatives of the divine authority. The powers that be are ordained of God, declared the Hebrew prophet. That's Micah. And that conception of God's sovereignty as delegated and exercised through appointed rules or rulers is discovered throughout the prophecy. He traced the sin and corruption, the sighing and crying, the agony and tears of the people to the misrule of the man in authority. In verses 6 and 7, it says that judgment will come because the false prophets have no vision and will be made ashamed. Micah informs the false prophets that in the time of their trouble, no prophecy will come to guide them. Instead, they should be ashamed because their predictions of peace have turned out to be deception or deceptive. In verse 8, Micah contrasts his own ministry to that of the false prophets. In this verse... Micah is full of the power of the Spirit and of justice and might. In contrast, the false prophets followed their own spirit. Here's what Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 3 says. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Micah was directed by the Spirit of the Lord. The statement may suggest Micah was filled with power to proclaim the divine message that, fill, that fell with force upon the years. Scripture provides an example. Luke 1.17 says, John the Baptist will also go before him, before Christ, in the spirit of power of Elijah to turn the arts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient, disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, Micah, Micah was filled with power. But he was also filled with judgment and knowledge of the justice and righteousness of God that made his work right and fair. And he was filled with might and courage to be able to deliver the divine communication against any and all opposition. For you to be able to do what Isaiah did and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the prophets that we have already studied in the Minor Prophets takes all that power, judgment, knowledge, might, and courage that comes from God. As such, Micah declares the transgression and sin of Israel. In this sense, Michael, uh, uh, Micah's ministry is totally different and opposite from that of the self-appointed, deceitful, false prophets 
who called evil good and good evil. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good, who put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. I hope you're getting the picture. Let's look at the indictment of Israel's leaders. Renewed. Micah chapter 9, I mean chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. Somebody can read that for me. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who built up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity, her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No arm can, no arm can come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Thanks so much, uh, Byron. I hope you can see the indictment of the iniquity of the rulers in those verses. In Micah, so in this passage of scripture, the prophet reviews briefly the inequity of the, uh, the iniquity of the rulers, the priests and the prophets, and announces the coming destruction of Zion and its temples. In Micah chapter 3 verses 9 to 11, so we're going to leave verse 12 until a little, uh, a little later, the prophet is once again addressing the rulers of Israel. In these verses, Micah reviews briefly the iniquity of the rulers, the priests, and the, and the prophets, or judges, and mention their sins. He tells them in verse 9 that they abhor justice and pervert equity, fairness. Thus, he condemns those who ought to be leaders in righteousness for their rejection of judgment and their perversion of all equity. These leaders who should have been examples of purity and the protectors of guardians of justice and fairness were making a mockery of the laws of God and men. In verse 10, Micah tells them that they built up Jerusalem with bloodshed and iniquity. They used extortion, rapaciousness, that's unfair methods to, of force, and judicial murders to accomplish the task. We read in Scripture that Naboth is murdered for his vineyard during Ahab's reign. Read chapter 21 of First Kings. I, I don't have the time to go there. Jeremiah 22, verses 13 to 15 says, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. Woe, says I, uh, uh, um, who says I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out w w um, widows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. Can you see what the, the, the picture that has been painted of these leaders? Amos chapter 5 verses 11 says, Therefore because you tread uh, down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. In verse 11, Micah goes on to say that whether just uh, judges, priests, prophets, or rulers, they all do it only for the money. 
thus falsifying the claim to trust in the Lord. I hope, to, I hope that you see these indictments here very clear. Instead of this dispensing impartial justice, the judges accepted bribes for favorable decisions against the defenseless poor. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 23 tells us, Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless nor does the cause of the widow come before them. This practice was strictly prohibited by the law, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 to 20. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, said the Lord to the Israelites, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with, just, with a just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the, the, eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The money and the gifts the priests received from the public Beyond their regular support, it only provided favorable instruction to the generous inquirer. Those apostate priests corrupted their sacred office by making these gifts and payments a means of securing gain. Likewise, the prophets for money provided suitable revelation for those willing to pay for them. They were afflicted with the spirit of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 15 says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Follow the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. While engaging in the wickedness, the magistrates, the priests, and the false prophets claimed to be worshipers of Jehovah. Note, theirs was a formal religion that was satisfied to substitute external conformity to inner righteousness and truth. Who? Go ahead, Byron. You have to think, if they're not prophesizing for God, there's got to be times when they're wrong, obviously. Right. So how is this working for them when it actually, when they're prophesizing the wrong thing? Absolutely. Yeah, they deceived themselves into thinking that because they had the temple of Jerusalem, and they were part of the temple of Jerusalem, they had the guarantee of the divine presence and favor and the defense against arm. Jeremiah 7, 1, 7. Could, could somebody read that for me? Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there is there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in at the gate, these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways, and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods in your hurt, or your heart, in your then yeah. I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Thank you. 
Jeremiah makes it quite clear. He provides a tremendous picture of the wickedness and, uh, and the reason for that. Therefore, in verse 12, Micah tells them that judgment will come upon Israel because of them, because of their sin. You see, Micah tells them that Zion shall be plowed like a field. Ooh, this is an incredible prophetic statement. It is worthy to mention that originally the name of the Jebusite stronghold Zion was a reference to the city of David, as we read in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. Later, however, Zion included the whole eastern ridge and the entire city of Jerusalem, as described in Psalm uh, 48, verses 1 and 2. And here's what it says. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. The city of, God, of our God? Jerusalem. In his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Being plowed like a field. Pay attention to that statement. Being plowed like a field is figuratively a description of total destruction. Isn't that what you do when you, when you plow a field? What happens? You turn the ground everywhere. All right? Okay. So, according to Jeremiah, the prophecy was given in the days of King Ezekiah. So if you know prophecy, and if you know your scripture, you know what happened to to, uh, to Judah um, and, of course, I I Israel before then. Here is what Jeremiah 26, 17, and 18 says. Then certain of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah of Morashet prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. That's Zion. Okay. So basically what was happening in Jeremiah's, Jeremiah was prophesying they were going to kill him because he said that. Like, who are you to say right. that? But somebody came and said, well, wait a second, this was also prophesied by Micah right. in the past. That's in right. The past time of King Hezekiah. And thus it was like, we didn't kill him. We're not going to kill him. So it right. basically saved Jer Jeremiah's life because Micah had. And by the way, that's in scripture, yeah. what you just said. So um, uh, I think, all right. I was looking at you. Yeah. So, the, the, uh, and the prophet also tells them that Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins. So not only will, um, as, as the scripture says, will, will, uh, will be plowed like a field, but it will be a heap of ruins. Okay. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17 says, Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in? Our Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. Now you know that Nehemiah came to rebuild Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was a heap of rubble. All right. What about Jeremiah, chapter 9, verses 11? I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a den of jackal. That's an interesting statement there, isn't it? And then it says, I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Please note that Micah's prophecy was fulfilled when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem when? 586 before Christ. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 17 to 21 provides an account of this destruction. I didn't put that passage of Scripture here. I encourage you to read it. It is worthy to note that Micah's message did not come to an end with chapter 3 and verse 12. As ominous as the message was in proclaiming the coming judgment, 
Micah now continues his message with a glimpse into the future. Into the future. And I'm looking forward to chapter 4. Micah moves from a bleak coming judgment. That's what we had uh, for the last 40 minutes. Bleak coming judgment. To a glorious distant future, as we will study in page 4. Are we ready to a change of mood a little bit in our presentation? I hope, however, that you understand why this is in Scripture. And this is not only for those people, it is for you and for me. Okay. The future exaltation of Zion and messianic hope. We are now going to look not only at... Uh, l l l l l let me not say much, otherwise we're going to be here in, until about 9.20 or so. The first section on the future exaltation of Zion and messianic hope is the glory to come in the latter days. We are actually going to look at latter days prophetically. All right, so somebody, I would love somebody to read Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 8 for me. Now it shall come to pass that in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Beautiful. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Just, just a second, Scott. I just want you to pay attention to that. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That should be telling you there is no more war. Go on, Scott. Go on, Scott. Okay. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. No one, no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord ha of hosts has spoken. For all the people walk, each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. That's a beautiful piece of scripture. And it encouraged me so much when I was studying chapter 4 and chapter 5. So, in the first, verse, in the first five verses of chapter 4 of Micah, the prophet describes what will happen in the latter days. So let's review that. In verses 1 and 2, the prophet tells us that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established and people shall flow into it. Zion. In verse 2, the prophet tells us that the people will want to learn of God's ways. And the word of the Lord will go f f uh, forth from Jerusalem. Oh, this is beautiful. We're not only talking about the New Jerusalem, but we're talking about the spiritual Jerusalem at this time. Oh, this is beautiful. Let's go on. Um, in verse 3, it tells us that the Lord will judge the nations, and there will be peace. And in verses 4 and 5, the prophet tells us that everyone will be content Walking in the name of the Lord forever. Note that verse, uh, verse 4 says, Everyone shall seed under his vine and under his fig tree. Mm. All you got to do is to read Revelation 21, 22, and you'll see a little bit of that. Please note that Prophet Isaiah, uh, Prophet Isaiah has a very similar prophecy. This is intriguing. I want you to read this with me and see how close this, these prophecies are. So let's read Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Somebody wants to read that for, for me? Mm -hmm. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw, concern, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. 
and all nations shall flow to it. That's almost the word for word. Though. Exactly. That one. This is beautiful. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning cooks. That's another same, 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 same sense. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay, let's have a little discussion and explanation. The prophecies of Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 and 5, and Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 and 4, are practically identical. And by the way, th this, this is remarkable because these were contemporary prophets. They lived during the same time period, okay? The differences are insignificant. However, the message is the same. It cannot be determined whether Micah quoted Isaiah or Isaiah Micah or whether both quoted an earlier inspired source or whether each was directly or independently inspired as they wrote this passage. We just don't know. We do know, however, that the two prophets were contemporary. They were prophets during the same time period. And we're going to read which, what each one of them said. Here's what Micah said. Micah chapter 1, verses 1. The word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, A.S., and Ezekiah, kings of Judah, which is so concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Okay? Israel and Judah. Let's now read what Isaiah says. Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which is so concerning Judah, and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah. So Isaiah was older than Uzziah, Jatham, the same king, Ahaz, the same king, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah. Can you see that? So the vision which both Micah and Isaiah describe refers to in the latter days. This phrase takes us to the last day times when God will establish his universal reign. What history has not witnessed, God fulfills. Ooh. Peace between nations has been the historical missing link. Wars have characterized international relations to this day. However, God, through his prophets, provides hope that it will not always be like that. These prophecies tells us that wars will cease. It tells us that the use of weapons will be obsolete. That the prophecy points to a time when God's purpose will be fulfilled. It points to a time of reconciliation and universal uh, worship of the unique God. The, per the, the pervasive cur uh, curse of fear will be eradicated from human hearts, and peace will be the reality of the day. Scott. Is this talking about the new Jerusalem? Because that it, seems like it that's doesn't seem like that's going to happen on earth anytime that's soon. That's it. This is why it's a messianic prophecy, because it involves not only Christ when he was um, empowered with ruling after his ascension into heaven, but it continues until he comes for us and brings us all to the city and, and, and the nation that he's preparing. Okay. Okay. So that's absolutely, absolutely correct. So the Messiah assumes the responsibility which Israel as a people were supposed to do. Pay attention. This is our God. Pay attention. They were supposed to mediate to mediate by drawing all nations to come to learn from God's people. Do you remember when he created, when he established Israel, what did he want Israel to do? To be a source of information, an attraction to other people, to get to know God. So now Jesus is the new center on whom co uh, converge the desires of the nation. The glorious promise of eternal peace is confirmed. And so verse 4 says, 
everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. The restoration is guaranteed. It is personal. It is also national and international. So then, what is the fulfillment of this prophecy? Let's look at that. What's the fulfillment of this prophecy? Let me start by saying, some people, primarily the premillennialists, who are the premillennialists? Those that believe in the millennium, believe uh, those that believe in the premillennium, believe that it is already, uh, that it is all yet to come. Some people, the amillennialists, these are people who believe that there will be no millennium, believe that it is already past. But I can't see that in the world we live in. Neither one. So, I'm inclined to believe, as Mark A. Copeland, the author of studies in the Minor Prophets, suggests, that there are past, that, that there are past, present, and future elements associated with this prophecy, and we're going to touch that. Copeland suggests that this prophecy began in Jerusalem when, with the preaching of the gospel um, on Pentecost. He tells us that Peter identifies the event of that day as beginning the fulfillment of what would occur in the last days. We're going to read that. Speaking of end time events, Prophet Joel says, and somebody could read that for me, verses 28 to 32 of Joel 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and, all, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and the an awesome day of the Lord. And I shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Thank you. Now notice that here Joel looks into signs that took place a few decades ago in this country. A, a, a couple of, quite a few, a hundred, 120 years, whatever it was, with the moon, the sun, the stars. Can you see that that happening? So I want you to know that it is important that we look at that because as I stated earlier on, this prophetic has an element of the past, an element of the present, and an element of the future. Okay. Thus, Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. But this is what was spoken of the prophet Joel. Now, he's, referring, he's, he's, he's making reference to, to, to the passage just read. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. The Apostle Peter, inspired by the Spirit, boldly identifies the preaching as a fulfillment of prophecy. So what happened at Pentecost? Just that. See, Jesus also said that the gospel would go forth from Jerusalem as prophesied. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47 tells us, Then Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it is was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Verse, verse 47 says, and that, um, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Yes? The thing we have to remember is the last time prophecy 
1844. Right. The Great Disappointment. When you see, and when as we study in plain revelation, you see that the moon had turned to blood in certain parts. You see that darkness had covered the land. That was in New England during Correct. the Revolutionary War, actually. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and you see, like, the earthquake, like the Lisbon earthquake. Correct. Mm -hmm. So these are all precursors Correct. to the ones that will come that will affect the whole earth. It's actually Correct. meant to wake people up. Correct. So, and, and remember, all that happened before Pentecost. I mean, uh, all that, no, all that happened after Pentecost. All that happened after Christ died for you and for me at the cross. But all those were precursors to the ultimate goal, which is redeeming God's people at the second coming forever and ever. And actually waking God's people up so they want to be redeemed. Correct, exactly. Would there be a possibility that some of these have multi-fulfillments like uh, you know, for example, yes. when Christ talked about the end of the world, some of the events were occurring at the destruction of Jerusalem, but some of them were for much later. Double prophecy. Yes, yeah. it, it's, it's how prophecy is. So, so it, when we read and study prophecy in Scripture, we, we know that there are time periods for certain things happening. Today, I was talking to, to one of my brothers about the, um, the outpouring of the... Uh, the latter rain. So what's the outpouring of the latter rain? The Spirit is in evidence again. Exactly. So. Just like at the former rain. Correct. Came down, exactly. The latter rain is God's last call. That's exactly. For people before the close of probation. Before the close of probation. That's exactly right. All right. So. Um, Jesus also said that the gospel would go forth from Jerusalem as prophesied. All right, number two. The prophecy continues as people respond to the gospel that originated from Jerusalem. Scripture tells us that such people have, have come to Mount Zion. Pay attention. This is, this is very good. The Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Listen, he's talking to the church uh, in Hebrew. I mean, in, in, uh, yeah, in, uh, in, in that area. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Note that Mount Zion represents the experience of believers under the new covenant. I want you to think about that a little bit. Because they have confidence to draw near before God through the sacrifice of Jesus, the atoning blood of Christ by which the new covenant was rectified and by means of which sin is pardoned. In Hebrews 20, uh, ch uh, chapter 12, verses 23, we, say, we read that the spirits of just man made perfect. What does that mean? It speaks of the sense of spiritual oneness. When, when we are together in fellowship with God, we are of one accord. You, you read that in acts one accord okay which believers enjoy in the presence of god's people we almost agree that it is only in a figurative sense that living christians can assemble before the throne of god as pictured in verses 22 to 24 so you and i know where is god in his throne where is jesus at his right hand is that there is a fulfillment in the sense of as Christians we come to yes. the throne of grace during our lives here at yes. this time, but also that there will be a future time when we are physically exactly physically. exactly. So and now it's a spiritual time. situation. You feel God's presence amongst us as God's people, and finally, when the Lord comes for the second time, 
and he brings us home, we are physically with God, together in Zion. All right. I hope that this is beautiful. So B, the people that have come to the Lord have learned the ways of the Lord. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And then verse 23 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit working through God and through Jesus Christ in you and, I, and me creates a godly spirit in you and I. So that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. In this passage of scripture, Paul exhorts believers to get rid of the old pattern of life, the old sinful life, and to put on the new Christ-centered inspired life. But let's go on. Uh, the judging among many people. As Micah mentions in chapter 4-3, may be both present and future. So we are describing this prophecy. And we are really also mentioning times. So the book of Revelation reveals, uh, reveals the Lord as judging both in the present and in the future. So let's look at that. Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27 says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works, until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. God shall rule them with a rod of iron. And they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from the Father. See, Christ received God's power and his ruler, over the earth and the universe. When, when, was that take, when, when did that take place? Ascension I, to heaven. The final battle with the devil and the demons took place. And God does what? You are the king of the universe. There's the coronation, coronation. And the signification of exactly. the coronation with the Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so Revelation chapter 20, verses 11, 15. Um, if somebody can read that, that helps me a little bit when you help me. That I can read it. Okay. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat, uh, who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See also Revelation 1, 5 and 17, 14. This, there you go, that was it. Right, thank you. Sure. This passage of scripture describes the judgment and destruction of Satan and the wicked. We see that Christ is in control, he is the leader, he is the king, he is the judge. But he will also have a final judgment. And Revelation chapter 20 speaks of it. See, the Apostle Peter so, also... When he yes. says, uh, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Right. There is no more death. That's after millennium. At the end of millennium, all that will be purified. Fire will consume the devil and the demons and the world that we know today will be purified through fire and brimstone. Okay. So uh, the, the Apostle Peter, that's a great question. The Apostle Peter also viewed some of Isaiah's prophecies as yet to be fulfilled. Let's look at that. 
Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 19 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people as a joy. When God, does, when our, Father, uh, our God, uh, uh, Christ, our, our Creator, when He is building Jerusalem, He's rejoicing. And when He created you and I, it is with joy. This is who God is. Okay, let's go on. Uh, it says in verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Mm. Isaiah 66, verses 22 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Oh, that's so encouraging. Peter tells us in 2 Peter, verses 3.13, that according to God's promise, as related to prophet Isaiah, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. You and I, our primary goal should be to look. Look for what? The new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth described by, by, by the Lord in Revelation. Therefore, Micah chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, may find some of its fulfillment in the eternal destiny of the redeemed. As part of the new Jerusalem, of the new heaven and the new earth, described in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Yes, Mark. Uh, it's not referring to the star and the sun and the moon. No. It's referring really to the atmosphere. Uh, yes. Because there's three heavens with the Jewish... Yes. Mindset. One is the atmosphere, two is the, the right. sun and the moon, the stars, and the third is where God dwells with the angels. Right. So, okay. As Michael continues to write, he describes what will occur in that day. So let's, let's read that. Let's read Micah 4, 6 to 8. It says, In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. Pay attention to who, who, what God does. I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from the now on, even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. That's going to happen as the Lord comes. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4 pictures God's plan for the rem remnant of Israel. You see, there has always been a remnant from the very beginning of this world until now, a remnant. It was hoped that a religious survived, survival would sweep the ranks of the exiles and that the Israelites at long last would accept their divine destiny. Prophet Micah, as forecasting the glorious results of such revival, unfortunately the failure of the Jews made impossible the fulfillment of those events with respect to literal Israel. Remember, God established the people on this earth to accomplish what he will eventually accomplish with a remnant. But the purpose was for Israel to be his people. Oh, okay. The purpose of heaven, God's purpose, will now be accomplished through the spiritual seed, which is the Christian church, Christ's church. Paul tells us in Galatians, Chapter 3, verses 7, 9, and 29. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Only those of faith are sons of Abraham. Verse 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing 
Abraham. If you are a descendant of Abraham, you have faith and you believe. That's what that says. And if you are Christ's, then you are what? Abraham's seed. And what? Here's according to the promise. Converts from all nations will be gathered into the spiritual kingdom of grace. Which at the second coming of Christ will become the kingdom of glory. See the apostle Paul tells us in his epistle to, to the Romans. That the Lord will assemble a remnant of those whom he afflicted. Who did he afflict? Before I go on. Who has the Lord afflicted? Israel. What happened to Israel? Because of their sins. Assyria. Got, got them out of the land. And took them. What happened to Judah? Babylon. Babylon. Why were they afflicted? Because of their sin. Was there a remnant? Yes, there was. Okay, now you understand. Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, says Romans 11.5. And Luke tells us in the gospel that God will reign over them forever. Here's what it says. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. I love that last sentence. Who is Jacob the father of? Israel and Judah. God's people. Woo! It's beautiful. In verse 8, yes. Okay, so the remnant, though, just so when you look at the remnant for Judah or Israel, it's those that have fallen asleep in Christ or God at that time. Those that will be resurrected. So there's two remnants. There's that yes. same remnant, the yes. ones that are alive when yes. Christ comes, yes. and the ones that are raised. It's exactly right. Byron's so, exactly right. Okay. Right. So in, um, in verse 8, Prophet Micah may have had in mind the figure of Jerusalem as watchtower and a stronghold. Okay, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. From, uh, from which Yahweh stood guard over his people. In this verse, verse 8, the prophet also refers to the regaining of the first dominion that was temporarily lost as a result of Edmund's transgression. Who had first dominion when the world was made? Christ did. What happened when Adam and Eve were tempted and failed? The dominion was given over to the devil. So when we talk about first dominion, it's Christ in control. When we talk about the last dominion, it's Christ in control. Okay. Abraham. Yes. The, the reason we're called, you know, Abraham was called and he responded. Christians are called just like Abraham Absolutely. was. Absolutely. And they respond like Abraham. So that's why the connection between the Abraham seed, we are Abraham right. seed. Right. And so we share the same faith and the same trust. Uh, so and that man. they, Christ regained that dominion really right. at the cross and resurrection. Correct. Even though he's still, the enemy's still here. That's correct. You know, it's really a Christ-owned world again. That's correct. And that's why we, are, we have focused in chapter 4 on a messianic prophecy. Right. And then Abraham was called by faith to come out of Ur of Chaldees, which was uh, Babylon. And yes. And called to come out of Babylon. Correct. So there's kind of a, a convergence, and he was going to the promised land the earthly Canaan, but we're going to the heavenly Canaan. Correct. Yeah. And last comment, and since the cross, Satan's been working overtime because now he knows his life. Not only did he lose dominion, he right. knows his time is short. His time is short. And he's no longer after God or after Jesus because he lost the battle. He's after you and me. Because we... Exactly. Jesus. That's exactly. All right. Let's look at Revelation eleven fifteen. Tells us, Then the seventh angel sounded. Ooh, this is a beautiful piece of scripture. 
And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of whom? Our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign when? Forever and ever. Now I'm going to ask two of you, one to read Prophets and Kings and one to read uh, The Great Controversy. Who, who's going to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Prophets and Kings. Satan by means of its success, oh, I'm sorry, Satan by means of its success is turning man aside from the path of obedience, became the God of this world. And that's in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The dominion that was once Adam's passed to the usurper, but the Son of God proposed to come to this earth to pay the penalty of sin, and thus not only redeem man, but recover the dominion forfeited. It is of this restoration that Micah, when he said, or yeah, that Micah when he said, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come even the first dominion. That's Micah 4 8. The Apostle Paul has referred to it as the redemption of the purchased possession, Amen. Ephesians 1 14. And the psalmist had in mind the same final restoration of man's original inheritance when he declared the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever psalms 37 29 thanks so much who's going to read um, great controversy i can read thank you scott the deepest interest manifested among men in the decisions of earthly tribunals but faintly represents the interest evinced in the heavenly courts uh, when the names entered in the Book of Life came up in review before the judge of all the earth. The divine intercessor presents the plea that all who have overcome through faith in his blood be forgiven their transgression, that they be restored to the Eden home and crowned as joint heirs with himself to the first dominion. And that's in Mark 4.8. Satan, in his efforts to deceive and tempt our race, has thought to frustrate the divine plan and man's creation. But Christ now asks that this plan be carried into effect as if man had never fallen. He asks for his people not only pardon and justification, full and complete, but a share of his glory and sit upon his throne. Thank you. I, I hope you can see how the spirit of prophecy can help us really understand Scripture. Please note that the fulfillment of this prophecy began with the first coming of Christ. And that the church is a spiritual kingdom in which the former dominion of Israel has been restored and given to Jesus who reigns from heaven. Matthew 28 verses 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Acts chapter 1, verses 6, six to 8. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put on his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Beautiful. All right. Let's now go into um, verses 9 to, um, to the first sentence of uh, verse 1 in chapter 5. And we're going to look at the distress and captivity before the restoration. This is very important. God... In, the, in chapter 3, indicts the leaders. In chapter 4, he paints hope and restoration. And now, at the end of chapter 4 and verse 5, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see what sort of a journey Israel and Judah had to go through in order to, to be able to really become the people of God. Okay? Somebody reads for me, uh, and uh, Danielle, if you can do that, uh, Micah chapter 4, 9, verses 5, 1. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? 
Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now also many nations have gathered against you who say, Let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. Mm -hmm. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. Excellent. For he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many people. Beautiful. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of, of the whole earth. Now gather yourselves in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. When I was reading this part of scripture and I was studying that, I'm going to be very open with you. I shed a little bit of tears. I did not know that God was so gracious to say to them, you are going to go into exile. But you are going to come out of there victorious. Victorious. For your protection. For your protection. And don't be afraid because these great nations will be destroyed. This is a great God. Okay, let's go. Let's, let's unpack. One thing is, he sends them there for their protection, right? Right. Protection from themselves. So themselves. Yeah. He actually sent them in exile so that they could, those that came out of it, purify themselves from their iniquities and their sin. This is the God we serve. So let's go into that. In verse 9, the prophet asks the question, Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? You know, the, the prophet is really being a little sarcastic to the leaders of that nation at this time. Here, Prophet Micah is informing the sons of Jacob that before they may en enjoy the blessings mentioned in verses 1 to 8, there would come the anguish of captivity. Before the crown, there would be the cross. As Jesus experienced. By the way, this is like a parallel to what happened to our Creator when He came into this world. Okay? Okay. Before smiles, there would be pain and tears. Judah lost its king and counselor and went into captivity when Jehoiakim and Zedekiah were taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. So in verse 10, Micah tells them that the judgment will involve, let's, let's put together, distress. And he, he paints the picture like a woman in labor. It will involve the Jews would be compelled to leave Jerusalem, live in the open country, in the field, while on the way to Babylon. And that eventually the Babylonian they would also be redeemed. A partial fulfillment of this prediction took place in 536 B.C. under Cyrus and subsequently under Artaxerxes. Okay. It is worthy to note that the returnees were not the spiritual revived people that the, the, that the, the uh, discipline uh, that the discipline of the exile and the instruction of the prophets were designed to produce. When the prophets were talking about it, they were envisaging something else. Consequently, the glorious prospect picture of Micah chapter 4 verses 1-8 was not realized by those who returned to the land of Judah after the Babylonian exit. I want you to pay attention to that. Micah concludes this chapter, Micah chapter 4, verses 11 to 5-1, by explaining that the restoration of God's people requires judgment on their enemies and rescue from their ends. Micah states in verses 11 that many nations have gathered against you. If the nation of the returned exiles had enjoyed 
the prosperity pictured in verses 1 to 8, opposition would have been aroused. Surrounding nations would have sought to crush the thriving nations. But God would have intervened to, the, to, to, to deliver the nations. We read in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them. There, on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. Okay? Interestingly, though, after the, the exile, when they came back, the one thing it did seem to cure them of was pagan word or idol worship. Yes, that's correct. Finally, is it Victoria's there? Yeah. 1,500 years? Uh, uh, yeah, that, that long. In verse 12, the prophet indicates that in their blind self-deception, nations like Syria and Babylon, and they were the lords of the exiled people, do not realize that they are working out not Zion's destruction, but their own. Oh, this is powerful. The threshing floor mentioned here indicates the valley of decision as a valley of threshing. In verse 13, Micah pictures God's people like oxen. When they tread out the corn, grain was also threshed by the oxen when they trampled upon the sheaves on the threshing floor. At times, of weighted at times a weighted sled was dragged behind the oxen. Metal hoofs would greatly facilitate the threshing of process. By the way, as a young child, I probably was nine in Portugal, I saw that take place. So when this came to, to my picture, or, or to, to my reading, I, I could actually see the oxen uh, pull the weighted slad, and I could see the grain coming out of the sheaves. It's beautiful. The nations who brought Israel and Judah into destruction and exile seek to defile Zion, whom God will use to break them into many pieces. Isaiah 41, verses 13 to 16 explains. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you warm Jacob. Now, you know, the Lord, the Lord loves Jacob, but he's obviously not very happy with Jacob. Calls him a warm, <laughs> warm Jacob. You may, you men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and, I, and our Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, when I read that, I said, what a, what a beauty. The Lord is going to help a worm. But that's who God is. Behold, I will make you into the new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat, the, 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 and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them. The wind shall carry them away. And the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy of Israel. Can you see the Assyrians and the Babylonians being totally destroyed? And you know history? It happened. In Micah chapter 5, the prophet warns Jerusalem to summon its armies. In view of the approaching danger, Israel was surrounded by enemy troops and Ephraim is called the daughter of troops, probably because of the concentration of troops surrounding uh, Israel at the time. Note that at the end of verse 1, Micah says, and I'm talking about chapter 5, verse 1, Micah says that they will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. This is one of the greatest insults and abuse. This happened to Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, verses 67 and 68. Then they spat on Jesus' face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ. Who is the one who struck you? 
the prophecy is messianic. And forecast the treatment the Messiah was to receive at the ends of his enemies. Can you see that this entire prophecy is messianic? It includes Christ and the people of Israel. I mean the people of Judah, the sons of Judah. All right, let's, let's, uh, talk, let's uh, look at the coming Messiah. These are beautiful verses. Somebody read that for me. Micah chapter 2 verses, uh, chapter 5 verses 2 to 5a. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, thou, though uh, you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth are from the old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time <coughs> that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide for now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. Oh, this is beautiful. We're talking about Christ primarily in these verses. So let's unpack them. In verse 2, we find the prophecy of the Messiah's birthplace. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. By the way, Bethlehem, house of bread. So well named. Jesus is the bread of life. Okay. A town just over five, five miles south of Jerusalem. Notice that the prophet identifies Bethlehem in Ephratah. This is important. And why is that important? It distinguishes Bethlehem from Bethlehem in the region. And because it refers to the Ephratite clan living there, it ties the city closely to King David, who was also born in Bethlehem and part of the clan. But in verse 2, the prophet also tells us that out of you shall come forth the one to be ruler. Micah tells us so because the Jews recognized this prophecy as messianic. By the way, in response to Herod's request as to whether Messiah was to be born, they quoted Micah chapter 5 verses 2. Christ would become the ruler of Israel. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Have you ever sung Messiah? I sang in a choir. I know this by heart. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be what? No hand upon the throne of David uh, and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from the time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The prophet also tells us that whose goings forth and from old, from everlasting. In this sen sentence, Micah cle clearly sets forth the pre-existence of the one who was to be born in Bethlehem. The going forth of Christ reached to eternity in the past. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And verse 3 says, All things were made through Him, and without Him it was made. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. Ellen G. White in The Desire of Ages, pages 19 provides the following insight. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God. Pay attention to these words. 
the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us. Therefore, it was prophesied of him, his name shall be called. In verses 3 and 4, and the first sentence of verse 5, Mike explains that Christ the Messiah will lead his people in peace. In verse 3, the prophet tells them that before Christ leads them in peace, they must be given up for a short time. What that means? Exile. Okay? They have to face Babylonian captivity. There would be suffering and affliction until their deliverance. In verses 3 and 4, Micah tells them that a remnant shall return, whom the ruler shall feed in the strength of the Lord. Okay? As the good shepherd, the Messiah, Christ, would stand firm in the care and defense of his sheep until the end. The Messiah's dominion would be universal. The first sentence of verse 5 says that this one shall be peace. This one. It has a capital O there. The reference here is to the Messiah. Jesus will not only rule in peace, but he is himself the author and the source of peace. And thus, John chapter 14, verses 27 says, Peace, I live with you. My peace, I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in, in me you may have peace. And the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, be of good courage. I have overcome the world. All right. So I hope that that was um, encouraging. The last section of the lesson uh, is really Micah chapter 5, verses 5b to 15. And it's really further judged on Israel and her enemies. So you had an indictment to the weakness and the idolatry. You have a prophecy talking about r restoration and reformation. And now we're going to say, okay, you need to pay attention. There are things that are not quite well with you. So turn to me. Okay, let's go into that. Please note, some scholars take the, the, the reminder of chapter 5, verses 5 to 15, of Micah to be messianic. I tend to agree with Mark Copeland, the author of our studies in Minor Prophets, that we need to understand the portion of Scripture as pertaining to Micah's day, not messianic now. Now we're coming back to Micah's day and those that follow shortly thereafter. Not only Micah's day, but the rest of the prophets moving forward. Okay. This section refers to judgment on Israel's enemies. All right? Let's read Micah chapter 5, verses 5b and 6. 5b is the rest of 5. When the Assyrians came into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds, an eight princely man. Uh, when I was reading this, I was saying, wait a minute. What can, what can seven shepherds and eight princely men do? Okay. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria. Come on. And the land of Nimrod and its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrians when he comes into our land, and when he treads within our borders. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. As we read in verse 5 and 6, the Assyrians' threat would prove to be no real threat to Judah. Ah. At the time of Micah's prophecy, 
Assyria was Israel's principal enemy, a sinister threat to her existence. However, as Micah suggested in chapter 4, 11, or 4, verses 11, Assyria would have not opposed the thriving nation of a restored Israel. And that's because God would intervene. Verse 5 mentions seven shepherds and eight princely men. The numbers given, seven and eight, although signifying an, an, an indefinite number, shows that Israel would have adequate leadership and strength against foreign aggression. Hmm. In verse 6, the prophet states that they shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria. This implies that Israel is to rule its enemies with a sword. In Micah chapter 5, verses 7 to 9, we read, Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no, um, that tarry for no man, no weight for the sons of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, who, if he passes through, both tears down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver. That's an incredible picture. A lion. Incredible. Your hand shall be lifted against your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. Okay, let's continue to unpack. By the way, according to God's plan for ancient Israel, victory over enemy opposition would have been followed by an intensive evangelism program. I want you to know that. The men of Israel were to enlighten the whole world with a knowledge of God. The three angels' message is an evangelistic program. Ellen G. White, in The Desire of Ages, pages 27, states, I want you to pay attention to that, God had chosen Israel. He had called them to preserve among men the knowledge of his law and of the symbols and prophecies that pointed to the Savior. He desired them to be as wells of salvation to the world. What Abraham was in the land of, uh, of his sojourn, what Joseph was in Egypt, and Daniel in the courts of Babylon, the Hebrew people were to be among the nations. They were to reveal God to man. Thus in verse 7 of chapter 5, the remnant of Jacob are called Jew from the Lord, and showers in the grass. These terms are most appropriate in the land where from about May to October, there was, for practical purposes, no rainfall. Yes, they're, they're in, in Assyria. It's dry. And he's saying, you've got to be dew. Dew comes every morning. You've got to be a rainfall. It's beautiful stuff. God desired the remnant of Jacob to be wells of salvation to the people. Deuteronomy, okay. In verse 8, the prophet equates the remnant of Israel to a lion among the beasts of the forest. A lion is a figure of conquering. People be the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy 28, 13 says, And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and I careful to observe them, that's what will happen to you. In verse 9, Micah, Micah assure, assures complete victory for God's remnant. When he says, All your enemies shall be cut off. Isaiah 6, 12 says, For the nation and kingdom which will not serve you shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. Please note, this might have been Israel's privilege following the exile. Unfortunately,
they however the people and God is now accomplished his church is Christ in Micah chapter 5 verses 10 to 15 God promises to destroy false strengths like horses and chariots and all idolatry will somebody read that for me this, this is great. Pay attention to this reading. Uh, verses 10 to 15 of chapter 5. Sure. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from the, your midst and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off sorcerers from you or from your hand, and you shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images I will also cut off, and your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. Thus I will destroy your cities, and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. Thank you. Let's face it. What was the problem with Israel? Well described here. Well described. They didn't depend on God. They became dependent on their own strength. The chariots, the horses. They didn't worship God. They worship what, he cre what they created. That was a problem. By the way, that's exactly. That's exactly. So we see sort of a parallel with that right now, where we are. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about here, but in the world. In the world. All right. So let's go, let's go into this. V verse 10 and 11 of chapter 5 describes the cutting off of those devices. And by the way, for you and for me to ever be part of God's kingdom, we've got to totally depend on God and not on self or anybody else. Okay. So, Verse 10 and 11 of chapter 5 describes the cutting off of those devices of war, horses and chariots, in which Israel had trusted when it should have trusted in the Lord. The fortified cities and strongholds, by the way, that's really sources of human reliance. When you've got a lot of people around you, you think that you're stronger. That's, that's what it says. Those would also be removed. In verses 12 to 14, God promises to get rid of sorcerers, soothsayers, pillars, graven images hand. From the very beginning, the Israelites were forbidden to practice sorcery and soothsaying. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Graven, ima graven images, images cut from stone, formed of clay, carved out of wood, or poured into molten metal were a form of idolatry, as were the standing image work of men's hands. These are forbidden by the second commandment of the Decalogue. Instead of having trust and faith in God who provided Israel all things to enjoy in their is the Verse 15 tells us that God will execute vengeance in anger and fury to the hidden and the nations that have not heard. And I bring in a great question for you because you're going to ponder about this statement. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4.8 asks you and me a great question. And this is the question. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, we're talking about a remnant, narrow road. Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? And I ended just with this statement. Let's commit our souls to God and be faithful to him. That is the appeal, the appeal of this lesson. The last page in your in your document is just a conclusion. A conclusion of what we've said. With a recurrent theme 
in his message being present judgment and future blessings. Micah proposes, uh, Mike, Micah's proposed appears to be twofold. First, to warn the people that they should repent as necessary and to encourage the people that their hope for future might help them to ensure the hard times to come. And their hope for, fu for, for the future is based on totally God, 100%. A similar twofold message is found in the New Testament. It includes warnings to pre preserve lest we fall away. In 2 Peter 3, 13, 14, to encourage us for whatever lies ahead. A, we have an advantage over the Israelites of Micah's day. We have already seen much of his prophecy fulfilled with the first coming of the Messiah. As Peter wrote, we also have the prophetic word made sure. We have no excuses, guys. No excuses. This year. Okay. The prophetic word is made more sure by virtue of its fulfillment. It can serve to comfort us and strengthen our hope regarding any future promise of God. I have a couple of notes here. The first, if God kept his promises concerning the first coming of his Messiah, we can have confidence that he will keep his promise concerning the second. Second note. Perhaps that is why Peter went on to say prophetic word with word you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day comes and star rises in your hearts so the final notes be careful study and consider both the old and the new testament our hope for the future is strengthened are there any questions i'm sorry we're about four minutes or five or whatever. I just want to point out similarities for us today on page 23 with the verses 10 and 11 for do we ever trust in things of our own device in this world? Exactly. Do, we trust, do we turn to God in everything or do I turn to God in the things that I can't handle? Right. Well stated. Um, in verses 12 and 14, so we might not have saucers and soothsayers, but we do have astrology, yeah. we do have psychics, we yeah. do have things like that that yeah. people might go to, and if not, we definitely have um, graven images, things that we make idols, not like they did back then. Exactly. You can even, you know, honestly, you can even have family members, you can make your spouse an right. idol. Exactly and, right. And anything Christ clearly says, if you don't hate everything before me and others, if you don't put me before everything else, he doesn't know you. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the last part is that, you know, we have to remember that God is the source of everything. Because life in Orange County isn't cushy at all. Yeah. <laughs> We're not self-reliant. We're not liable to see it. Uh, and it's getting worse and worse, Byron. Oh, You're oh, absolutely wait, right. Wait, wait, and that is sarcasm. On my that's mind, exactly. So. That's exactly. <laughs> but I want to thank you. That's a great summary. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you can see God in these lessons. I hope you can see how God is so marvelous. Yes, he, sin he abhors, but he loves the sinner. And he's forever pleading with the sinner. And in God's case, he will forever say, you continue to sin, and this is what's going to happen to you. But if you get out of there, I tell you what, you, you want to be part of my family. And we really are going to have a marvelous, glorious time together. That's really what it is. All right. I want to thank you. I want to ask the Lord to bless us. By the way, happy Sabbath. May I say that to you? A blessed Sabbath to all of you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your word. Lord, what an inspiration. We know different than Israel or Judah. And yet, Lord, we want to be part of the remnant. Now, Lord, it's very difficult to be part of the remnant on our own 
on our own way. We want you to be part of our life. Lord, I'm often reminded of the Apostle Paul when he said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Lord, I don't want to live no more of my own accord. I don't want to sit behind the wheel, Lord, anymore. I want to be a passenger on your chariot. Lord, forgive our sin. Bring us out of Babylon and Assyria, Lord, and help us to move and restore Jerusalem with you. Father, I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you, Lord, for the indwelling of the Spirit in us as the Holy Spirit transforms our character into the character you want us to be. And Lord, I so much want to thank you for the written word. Help us, Lord, prioritize our time at the word and in our knees, asking for your blessings and your anointing. Give us a good night's rest, for I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.